The moment of truth is coming. How will Jacob bless his children? Who will be promised fortune and who will be cursed? Welcome to the Bible Paladin as we come to the final blessings that Jacob will bestow on his children. These chapters have a number of callbacks to previous chapters, but also foreshadow events that we will hear about later in the Hebrew Scriptures. But before we get to the twelve sons of Israel, first we will hear about his two grandchildren, Manasseh and Ephraim. And so we pray for the wisdom of the Holy Spirit as we read and reflect on the sacred scripture. Sometime afterward, Joseph was informed, Your father is failing. So he took along with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. When Jacob was told, Your son Joseph has come to you, he rallied his strength and sat up in bed. Jacob then said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz, in the land of Canaan, and blessing me, he said, I will make you fertile and numerous, and raise you into an assembly of tribes, and I will give you this land to your descendants, after you as a permanent possession. Your two sons, therefore, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I joined you here, shall be mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine, as much as Reuben and Simeon are mine. Progeny born to you after them shall remain yours, but their heritage shall be recorded in the names of their two brothers. I do this, because when I was returning from Padan, your mother Rachel died, to my sorrow, during the journey in Canaan, while we were still a short distance from Ephrath, and I buried her on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. When Israel saw Joseph's sons, he asked, Who are these? They are my sons, Joseph answered his father, whom God has given me here. Bring them to me, said his father, that I may bless them. Now Israel's eyes were dim from age, and he could not see well. When Joseph brought his sons close to him, he kissed and embraced them. Then Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face again, and now God has allowed me to see your descendants as well. Joseph removed them from his father's knees and bowed down before him with his face to the ground. Here we have the first of a series of deathbed blessings that Jacob will bestow, and it is reminiscent of the blessings that he received from his own father. And we will see more similarities as we continue, especially as he is near death and failing in his eyesight. Now, some scholars suggest that there may be the inclusion of more than one version of this story, especially as Jacob asks who his grandchildren are after he already met them. But for anyone who's ever cared for an aging parent or grandparent, especially one with dementia, the story is really not that unusual. What's her name again? And can be seen as one uninterrupted narrative. But the way in which he claims his grandchildren is a bit interesting. Due to Reuben's sin of sleeping with his father's concubine, he lost his birthright. And so it seems that Jacob is transferring it to Joseph's sons instead. But what about Simeon and Levi? They would have been next in line, right? As we will see in the next chapter, they are punished because of what they did in Shechem. Judah should then be next, and we'll get to him later, for he does receive a lion's share of the blessing. But essentially, Jacob goes to the firstborn of his beloved, Rachel. Jacob justifies the decision to adopt Joseph's children because Rachel died young and was unable to give him more children. By claiming Manasseh and Ephraim, he is giving Joseph a double share of the inheritance because Joseph will basically receive two tribes through his children instead of one like each of his brothers. And culturally, the birthright of the firstborn is to receive a double share of the father's goods. In verse 12, we are told that the children are on Jacob's knees. And this may be more than just a grandfather holding his children, but refer to the rite of adoption in which Jacob claims the children as his own. And speaking of rituals, usually a blessing is given with the right hand. And if there are two blessings, the one who is under the right hand may receive a greater blessing. Now you may see where this is going, so let's continue reading to see what happens. Then Joseph took the two, Ephraim with his right hand to Israel's left, and Manasseh with his left hand to Israel's right, and led them to him. But Israel, crossing his hands, put out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim, although he was the younger, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, although he was the firstborn. Then he blessed them with these words, May the God in whose ways my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the Lord who has been my shepherd from my birth to this day, the angel who has delivered me from all harm, bless these boys, that in them my name may be recalled and the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and they may become teeming multitudes upon the earth. When Joseph saw that his father had laid his right hand on Ephraim's head, this seemed wrong to him. So he took hold of his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's, saying, That is not right, father. The other one is the firstborn. 
lay your right hand on his head. But his father resisted. I know it, son, he said, I know. That one too shall become a tribe, and he too shall be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother shall surpass him, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. So when he blessed them that day and said, By you shall the people of Israel pronounce blessings, may they say, God made you like Ephraim and Manasseh. He placed Ephraim before Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, I am about to die, but God will be with you and will restore you to the land of your fathers. As for me, I give to you, as to the one above his brothers, Shechem, which I captured from the Amorites with my sword and bow. Jacob is old and nearly blind, and so Joseph makes sure that he lines up his sons appropriately and so that they will receive the right blessings. Now Jacob, the old trickster, switches his hands so that he has one on the opposite child that Joseph thought he would be blessing. And Joseph, too, has his head bowed, so he doesn't notice this until after the blessing. And the way that he grabs his father's hand and tries to move them shows that he probably thought that his senile old dad was just messing up. But Jacob corrects him and says, son, I know what I'm doing. So why did Jacob do this? Was it just because he believed that the second born should be blessed more than the first as he was? Or is there something deeper? As we have seen before, blessings are ultimately from God and even act as a sort of prophecy. Jacob knew that God is chosen Ephraim over his older brother Manasseh, just as God had chosen him over Esau. For more detailed commentary on the custom of the firstborn and how God often goes against that, check out this video. However, in this case, both children are indeed given the same blessing. It's just that Ephraim will be more blessed, as his father says he will surpass his brother. So let's look at the blessing itself. First, he calls upon the God who walked with his forefathers, Abraham and Isaac, and then he refers to the Lord as his shepherd. This was the first reference to God as a shepherd, which is quite a statement considering the profession of this family as it was highlighted in the last chapter. More than seeing the Lord as just his ancestral God, Jacob understands the nature of God as one who acts as a shepherd for his family, as he himself has for his flocks. He acknowledges the very personal relationship that he has had with God throughout his life. He then addresses the blessing to the angel who delivered him. Is this the angel with whom he wrestled? Or perhaps he is referring to the one that led him to meet his wife Rachel, or those that accompanied him throughout all of his sojournings. Remember that his encounters with angels were often indistinguishable from an encounter with God. It is also interesting that he includes his own name with the name of his father and grandfather when he speaks about the God of his ancestors. And finally, the blessing ends, as usual, with a promise of many descendants. After the blessing, Jacob reassures Joseph that he too will be blessed and God will restore his family to the land promised. He also tells Joseph that his tribes will inherit Shechem, which can mean a couple of things. This could refer to the city that Simeon and Levi sacked, but Jacob says that he himself captured it from the Amorites. Also, the two brothers responsible will be punished for what they did to the city of Shechem. The Hebrew word Shechem is also a common noun, meaning shoulder or mountain slope. So it may not be referring to the city itself, but the general area. Either way, Joseph is told that he will make out better than his brothers when all is said and done. And speaking of his brothers, now is time to hear of the blessings that Israel bestows upon them. Jacob called his sons and said, Gather around, that I may tell you what is to happen to you in days to come. Assemble and listen, sons of Jacob. Listen to Israel, your father. You, Reuben, my firstborn, my strength and the first fruit of my manhood, excelling in rank and excelling in power. Unruly as water, you shall no longer excel, for you climbed into your father's bed and defiled my couch to my sorrow. Simeon and Levi, brothers indeed, weapons of violence are their knives. Let not my soul enter their counsel or my spirit be joined with their company. For in their fury they slew men, in their willfulness they maimed oxen. Cursed be their fury so fierce, and their rage so cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob, disperse them throughout Israel. You, Judah, shall your brothers praise. Your hand on the neck of your enemies, the sons of your father, shall bow down to you. Judah, like a lion's whelp, you have grown up on prey, my son. He crouches like a lion recumbent, the king of beasts, who would dare rouse him? The scepter shall never depart from Judah, or the mace from between his legs while tribute is brought to him, and he receives the people's homage. He tethers his donkey to the vine, 
His purebred ass to the choicest stem. In wine he washes his garments, his robe in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine, and his teeth are whiter than milk. Zebulun shall dwell by the seashore. This means a shore for ships, and his flank shall be based on Sidon. Issachar is a raw-boned ass, crouching between the saddlebags. When he saw how good a settled life was, and how pleasant the country, he bent his shoulder to the burden, and became a toiling serf. Dan shall achieve justice for his kindred, like any other tribe of Israel. Let Dan be a serpent by the roadside, a horned viper by the path, that bites the horse's heel, so that the rider tumbles backward. I long for your deliverance, O Lord. Gad shall be raided by raiders, and he shall raid at their heels. Asher's produce is rich, and he shall furnish dainties for kings. Nephtali is a hind let loose, which brings forth lovely fawns. Joseph is a wild colt, a wild colt by a spring, a wild ass on a hillside. Harrying and attacking, the archers opposed him, but each one's bow remained stiff, as their arms were unsteady. By the power of the mighty one of Jacob, because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel, the God of your father who helps you, God Almighty who blesses you, with the blessings of the heavens above, the blessings of the abyss that crouches below, the blessings of breasts and womb, the blessings of fresh grain and blossoms, the blessings of the everlasting mountains, the delights of the eternal hills. May they rest on the head of Joseph, on the brow of the prince among his brothers. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf, Mornings he devours the prey, and evenings he distributes the spoils. There is a lot of symbolism in these verses. Some of them are fairly obvious, and some of them may be more clear as we learn more about these tribes. Reuben is first praised for his rank and power, and then told that he will no longer excel due to his sin. Simeon and Levi are grouped together, and their actions are cursed rather than blessed. The knives may refer to the instruments of circumcision that they use to trick and kill the Shechemites as their families are now cursed and will be dispersed because they killed men and cattle in their rage. This may refer to the future situation in which the tribe of Simeon is absorbed into Judah, and the tribe of Levi becomes a priestly tribe without a land of its own. Judah, as we might have guessed based on his actions in the last few chapters, is raised above his brothers. In fact, he is compared to a lion, which later seems to be a symbol for his tribe. The scepter is a symbol for royalty, as kings will come from him. And the mace between his legs? Well, let's just say that it has to do with the age-old promise of having many descendants. He is also given the promise of wealth and abundance, with references to the vine and trampling of grapes. An allusion to wine and blessings is generally a good thing. The other blessings are much shorter in comparison, and are often plays on their names or the areas in which they will settle. Zebulun by the sea. Issachar as one who will go from the nomadic life to a sedentary one, which was typically frowned upon. The name Dan has the same root as the verb to achieve justice, and there is an interesting insertion of Jacob calling on the Lord for deliverance after he compares Dan to a serpent who will cause his enemies to stumble. Interesting. Gad, whose name is similar to the word for raid, is spoken of as such. Asher is blessed with rich produce. Naphtali will have beautiful children. And here Joseph, like his older brother Judah, is given a glorious blessing, which is much longer than his brother's. He is also called a wild colt and a mighty warrior because he has prevailed over just about everything life has thrown him and has stood out amongst his brothers. And here Jacob uses his own name outright in the blessing, and he also once again calls the Lord his shepherd and the rock of Israel. And this blessing encompasses everything from the heavens to the depths of the earth, to pleasure and fertility, to expanses of land. And finally, he calls Joseph a prince among his brothers. And finally, Benjamin, whom he compares to a wolf who devours his prey, but who is just when distributing the spoils. At this point, other than the blessings of Joseph and those of his eldest brothers, most of these really don't tie into the story, at least not yet. But we will hear much more about these other tribes as we continue through the books of the Bible. And so up until this point, what exactly are we hearing in these blessings? And what can we gain from it from a theological point of view? First, we have the blessings of Ephraim and Manasseh. In some ways, we can see them as replacements for the sons who failed their father. While Reuben and the others do not lose their place as the sons of Israel, they will not receive the same blessings as the other children. This is a common theme in the Old Testament in which a sin seems to be punished or carried forward through many generations. This does not mean that the individual who sinned was not forgiven, 
but that the transgression has effects that echo forward, regardless of any amount of remorse or penance. We saw this with the sin of Adam and Eve, as well as that of Noah's son Ham and the descendants of Canaan. The theological concept is that an offense against God has consequences that human beings cannot atone for on their own. While rituals and sacrifices will be prescribed to ask for forgiveness and atonement, the supernatural consequences must also occur. The two concepts of compassion and justice must be fulfilled. For Christians, the only way to fully remove the guilt of sin will be understood through the sacrifice of Christ. With this in mind, we look to the blessings of the twelve tribes. When Jacob calls his sons together, the expression in Hebrew indicates that the words that he will utter will go beyond their lives and extend to future generations. Also, these blessings act as a prophecy, not in the sense that Jacob has any power to make them come to fruition, but rather that God has allowed him to observe what will befall his family, for good or ill. Jacob then acts as a spokesperson for the Lord, who is above time. Ultimately, this shows that even though God has chosen this family to fulfill his plan and from whom the Messiah will come, they are still human. God does not control their actions or that of their neighbors. They will still undergo trials and difficulties, and they will be able to call upon God for help when they need to. But ultimately, it is their actions that will determine their fate, even though it is a fate that God is aware of. There's no fate but what we make for ourselves. The takeaway, of course, is that as they move forward in their lives, God will be present to them. For their part, they need only to remain faithful to the God of their fathers and not forget his involvement in their lives. The same can be said for believers today. Our lives may indeed be filled with trials and difficulties, and some of these may be the results of family situations and histories that we are not even aware of. So where does God come in? Can we still seek the Lord in the moments of struggle and call upon the one who can be our shepherd, our rock? In the middle of the blessings, Jacob pauses and calls for deliverance. He may have been distressed in seeing that the trials that his family will have to go through, but also encouraged that the Lord will not abandon them, for they were chosen for a greater purpose. And I believe that each of us, each of you, is chosen for a greater purpose as well. We may not always have someone to bless us and tell us what to expect, as Jacob did, but perhaps our reading of the Bible might give us some insight into what God has in store for us. Prayerfully considering God's will may take us in directions that will open up new possibilities and bring life that we had previously not thought possible. Thank you so much for joining me in our reading and reflection on the scriptures. And I look forward to next time when we'll hear of Jacob's passing and conclude our journey through the book of Genesis. Until then, be blessed and do good.